listen, isn't Jesus wonderful? Lord Jesus, you are wonderful. You're wonderful and worthy. Thank you. Please be seated. Oh, he's wonderful and he's worthy. You can't praise him too much. Look at all those angels been there for eons and they just can't stop crying out, holy, holy. Wow. Since there's an innumerable amount of angels, that means there's more than you can count. And every one of them laud praise on Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, man. Angels are all around us. You know that, don't you? I wrote a book about angels. I name them in here. I name their ministries. And, I, and it's a pretty amazing. Every one of us have an angel that looks just like us. What? Some of them are going, oh, what did I do? You know. <laughs> but it says that, uh, remember when Peter was kept in prison? And the church was praying? And Pete gets out of prison, comes to the, the door where they're praying, knocks on the door. Little girl opens the door. And she, she runs back in for the prayer meeting and says, what? Pete's here. Pete's here. What does the people say? Oh, no, no. It must be his Amen. angel. Do you see between the lines? They were so common then that they knew that they had angels that looked like them. They thought that's who it was. Oh, man. Isn't that, the Bible talks about children's angels face always before the face of God. Isn't that? So when you get a baby, a baby gets a, an angel that looks just like them, and their face always stands towards God. That's what the Bible says. You'll find it in this book. Isn't that something? Angels really are really, really real. They're real. They'll come see you if you want them. I gave you a verse about seeing angels. You want it? You want it? Yes. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. That's what it says. Open his eyes, Lord, that he can see. Immediately his eyes was open and he could see into the spirit realm. Wow. You believe you can see further with these eyes than these eyes? Yes. I talk fast, but Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with revelatory light. You will have a grasp and a comprehension of the ways of God. Paul said, we look at what we can't see. Wow, wow. Isn't that something? Yeah. He said, what you can see is temporary. What you see that you can't see is eternal. Yeah. I was preaching and I'd push like that and I, I felt something felt like saran wrap. I said, Lord, what is that? He said, he called it a membrane. He said, it's a membrane between the spirit world and this world and it's thinner than it's ever been. Wow. It's accessible into the spirit realm if you want to get there. Yeah. yeah. Did you know the spirit realm is more real than this realm? Yes. This is a temporary realm here. Spirit realm is eternal realm. Yes. We need to start living more from the eternal realm than the temporary. Yes. Don't you think? Yes. I do to angels. I hope you'll get the book on angels, the faithful and the fallen. We talk about uh, how they minister to us. They really do minister to us. Uh, they can minister to us physically. My wife and I, were, we travel a lot. and uh, Most of the time we put our luggage in luggage. And this time uh, my wife would put some uh, clothes in a hang bag. And I'm not used to the hang bags, you know. Anyway, we get on the, uh, off of one plane, onto the next plane, and I'm just buckling in. I thought, oh my goodness, I've left the hanging bag back in the other plane, all the way down to the terminal, and the plane's just about to take off that we're on. And so I told my wife, I said, I've got to go get the clothes. I left it in the other terminal. I said, now, if I miss a plane, they'll put me on another one, but you stay here, because, you know, and so anyway, so I get the plane and uh, I start down the jetway and it's, here comes a, 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 the nicest looking uh, stewardess and she's coming like this and she says, here brother, here's your wife's clothes. And I thought, and I thought now that was so nice. So I took them and turned around and there ain't nobody there. It was an angel. An angel had come and brought my wife's clothes. I come back in, my, my wife goes, whoo, that was quick. I go, it's quicker than you think. <laughs> Some angels came and parked Bob Jones' truck. You, you ought to heard it. The wildest thing, Bob Jones and John Paul Jackson, both of them are in heaven watching this service today, but this is, that's true. And so anyway, uh, Bob, Bob Jones and John Paul Jackson were supposed to catch an airplane at a certain time. They woke up in the hotel, and they woke up the time the plane was leaving. And, they, oh, and so uh, uh, John Paul said, well, I said, uh, I guess we'll just have to try to rebook. Bob says, nope. Nope, I think if we'll throw our stuff in there, we can get on. And John Paul said, well, the plane's leaving now. And here's what happened. They got to the airport before they left the hotel. It's the craziest thing. You... Yes, they got to the airport before they left the hotel. And two guys walked up to them and said, uh, tickets, we've, got take, we've taken care of the luggage and we'll park the truck. 
And so here's what happened. They get even first class seat. And there, Bob said, I buckled in. And John Paul looked at me and said, boy, I'm glad your friends were here. He said, my friends? I thought they were yours. <laughs> it was angels had come and parked the truck. And when Bob and John Paul got back to the, the airport, there was Bob's red truck and the keys was hanging off the sun visor. Angels are ministering spirits sent down to aid us who are the heirs of salvation. That means they're here to help us. They're stronger than us. They're purer than us. But they're under us. They can't understand how God will offer us grace every day. He never offered them uh, grace that failed one single time. But constantly, day after day, God offers us fallen humanity grace. Hey, remember it says when we get saved, they peer into it. That means they look with wonder and awe because they can't understand God's divine love toward just wicked sinners. Wow, isn't that something? Yeah, boy. They're everywhere. And I'm telling you, we need to learn how to activate the angels. I got caught up, well, I'm talking fast. I got caught up in heaven. Oh, Lord. I saw angels as far as the eye could see, dressed like uh, Navy SEALs or Army Rangers. or I mean, I mean, listen, the toughest of the tough lined up like military people. And I said to the Lord, Lord, put them to work. He said, not my job. He said, it's your job to go back to the people of God and train them and get them to the place of maturity. When they speak, they speak the oracles of God and that will move the angels. Amen. They move at the bidding of the Word of God. You can't order them around. You ain't, you, ain't got, you ain't got enough clout to order the angels around. You have to get so full of the things of God. When you speak, you're speaking the oracles of God. And that's what they move at His bidding. They move at the Word of God. All right? I got high hopes for you. I'm serious. Okay? All right. Don't squander these moments. Okay? I'm serious. I'm telling you. I told this guy, I said, he's going to make up his mind. He's not going to wreck himself with what's wrecking the people around him. Like Daniel. Okay, all right. Amen. All right. Amen. Don't make me come straighten you out. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm throwing a commissioning on you, and you'll stop a lot of people from suicide. Okay? All right. Well, that'll be good. All right. We got, to, we got to talk about some stuff. Christopher, come here just a moment. This is Christopher Martin. He's worked for us for 10 years. And just greet the people. Joe will give you a microphone or something. This is good. Come on here. Hello. Well, thank you all so much for being here. We so appreciate it. And uh, Pastor Joe and Melinda, they're, they're really awesome, awesome people. You all are really fortunate. And uh, Brother Mark, I, I've so enjoyed uh, our time with them. And it's an honor to, to, to be with Bobby and to serve Bobby and Carolyn. They're just amazing people, amazing men and women of God. I, I was thinking this morning about them. And, you know, Bobby's been preaching for 50 years. 50 years he's been preaching. Isn't that amazing? You know, and, and, and listen... Carolyn, Carolyn, Bobby's wife, she, she has so poured, her heart is so much for the people, for the things of God, for the ministry, and to see Bobby be, be a, a success in all that he does for the Lord Jesus and, and her heart. So I just thank her so much for, for her heart and all the efforts that they've put in and the entire family. You know, to serve God, to pour out, to know the things of God, the precious, precious things of God are costly. And, and I'll be honest, you'll never know the sacrifices that they've paid for them to be able to share the hidden secret truths. So I want to encourage you to understand if it's not costly, it won't be precious and you won't defend it. So when God is working on you and it hurts and it's hard and there's sacrifices and you feel like, what am I doing, Lord? Those are the most precious things. You know, the Lord took me to, to the secret place and it cost me everything. And it was four years, and I would cry out daily, God, why are you killing me? I was so in anguish. It was so hard. And I'll tell you something. It's the most precious time of my life, and I wouldn't trade a single minute of it. Not, not the microphone, the signs, what, nothing can take that away from me. So, so let God do all that he wants to do. And he, I'm telling you what, 
it'll be the most glorious thing you'll ever deal with. So th th thank you so much. Thank you, Christopher. Good. Oh, he's been invaluable to us as far as helping us and doing all a lot of the media stuff. And he does my scheduling. Uh, I am a, I'm ruthless in my scheduling. You know, people will go, well, can you come? And I'll go, yeah, I'll be there. And oh, man. And, you know, calendars hardly mean nothing to me, you know. He, and so uh, Christopher will have to straighten out all of those things. Well, Bobby's schedule here and there and, you know. But anyway, it's wonderful. It's just marvelous. God told me, say, he told me, he said, don't go unless you're sent. And so that's what we do. Every day we get stacks of invitations around the world to come somewhere. But God said, don't go unless you're sent. So that's what we try to do. But we're going, we're going to have a good time. Don't go to church and not have a good time. Amen. I told you earlier, some people have just enough Jesus to be miserable. <laughs> they got him in the head, but not the heart. They got a lot, a lot of rules, regulations, stipulations, manipulations. I, I, I've read the Bible. You should too. God don't even like religion. <laughs> I dare you read Isaiah chapter 1, come back today and tell me God likes religion. Have you read it? Away with your new moons and your Sabbaths and your holy convocations. They weary me. That's what God says. I pour the sizzling of your fat. Isaiah chapter 1. Wait a minute. God set up all those rituals, all those feasts, all those festivals. Why? To point to a relationship. But when we jump the relationship and hang on to the ritual, we got religion. Hey, God don't like religion. Every woe in the lips of Jesus Christ in the New Testament was to the religious Pharisee. Those that held on to the ritual and denied the relationship. He don't like religion. Man does. He's got something to run. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, boy, you'll run in the ditch. That thing get loose from you, run over you, man. I want us to depend upon the Holy Ghost, don't you? Anyway, so... Uh, get the angel book, if you will, and then here's a book on prayer. Oh, man, I tell you, the Lord said, I want you to tell my people what real prayer is. It's an audience with the king. Wow, we can come to Jesus Christ anytime, any place, day or night, and let our requests be made known unto him. First John 5, 14 said, this is, this is the confidence we have in him. If we will ask him anything according to his word, we know that he hears us. If we know that he hears us, we're totally confident we're going to get what we're asking. Now, I'm telling you, he that comes to God, Hebrews says, we must believe he is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. If you don't expect an answer from prayer, don't pray. And some people say, well, I, you know, if God wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. No, he won't. You have not because you ask and you shall receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open. You can bug God and get more out of him than he intended to give you. <laughs> remember, the, remember the little widow and the unrighteous judge? She pestered, didn't she? Yes. Well, you know, no, I just, you know. No, we need to learn to pray. Some, I've, had, I've had grown Christians say, well, Bobby, I don't know how to pray. You can talk, can't you? <laughs> That's what prayer is, is talk to God. Yes. Jeremiah 33, 3, God never intended for prayer to be a monologue. What's a monologue? One person talking. He wants it to be a dialogue. Call unto me, I will answer you. Wow. And I will show you great and mighty things. Unaccessible things. Things that are not accessible to you. Pray them into accessibility. Amen. Wow. We need to start being a praying people. All right. There's a prayer book. And I'm going to talk about this in just Wow. For 24 years on the Day of Atonement, we have a visitation from Jesus. This uh, weeks even before the Day of Atonement, I'd be walking and change would fall. Coins, <laughs> they'd fall at my feet. I'd be sitting at my desk, clink, change would fall. I'd be walking down the airplane terminal, slunk, change would fall. Change! I got a stack of change. And finally, after days and days of change falling, I said, hey God, what is this? He said, announce to the body of Christ, Change is in the air. Yeah. And then he said, announce to them their spiritual tomorrow will not look like their today. Amen. And in this, in this Shepherd's Rod book, we talk to you about how God says he is releasing an anointing to get you a sevenfold payback of everything the devil's stolen from you. A sevenfold payback. It's in the Bible. We show you in this book. We show you how to bind the strong man so you can plunder his house. Yeah. 
Or don't you want to plunder his house instead of him plundering yours? I thought, well, that's right. Okay. Sevenfold payback. Boy, Heidi, it's in here. I want you to know God is going to... It says, here's what it says in the book of Daniel. The evil forces ruled and raged until the Ancient of Days stands, drops his gavel, and renders a verdict in behalf of the saints of God. God is going to render a verdict in behalf of the saints of God. Wow. You ought to read the Bible about how God wants to be, act on your behalf. Psalms 112. You ought to read that. It says the favor and the blessings of God will get on your life in such a dimension. The, the increase in your life will be so magnanimous and big. It'll make your enemies so mad, they'll gnash their teeth and walk away. I mean, that's better than a lawsuit, don't you think? <laughs> Psalms 112, study it. The favor and the blessings of God will get on your life and the increase will be so big, it'll make your enemies so mad. One of them says they'll, they'll gnash their teeth and melt away. Well, that's good. Yeah? Okay. So we talked about the angel book. Yeah, we'll talk about some other stuff here in a moment. <sighs> Everybody okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I feel good. That's a Jack Brown song, isn't it? <laughs> Did I tell you when I was up at Bethel? I was up there at Bill Johnson's church one time doing their uh, uh, pastor's conference. They were, they were pastors from all over the world there. So I'm supposed to be preaching. And I get up there and I say just what I just said. I said, I feel good. I go, my God, that's a James Brown song. There was a, sta- there was a pastor, a black pastor from Stockton, California, sitting on the front row. I'd met him and uh, boy, I'll tell you what, most immaculate dressed. His tie matched his handkerchief. His socks matched his... He was put together, man. <laughs> so me being me, when I said... Why, that's a James Brown song. I jumped off the platform, ran over there, and I said, get up and sing me some James Brown songs. He goes, what? I said, well, get up and sing me some James Brown songs. He said, I don't think I know any. I said, well, hum one. So I gave him the microphone, and this pastor, he starts out, and he gets into this rhythm, and he says, and Papa's got a brand new bag. I said, shut up. That's it. Sit down. I said, God is sick and tired of the church operating out of Haggai's bag. He wants us to operate out of Papa's bag. You remember Haggai's bag? Haggai's bag, every time he reached for something, it was empty. Why? The bag had a hole in it. Why did the bag have a hole in it? He was busy building his kingdom, neglecting God's kingdom. So I screamed at Bill Johnson, Get a bag. Bill took off somewhere, ran back with a grocery bag, set it down there in front of the church. Now, this is a pastor's conference. Those pastors jumped up, ran forward, threw $28,000 in that bag. You couldn't have put a pistol on them got that much money. Isn't that crazy? What we got to do is kind of chill out. Drop a lot of our plans and, and strategies and just let the Holy Ghost do what He wants to do. If he wants to hum a few bars of James Brown, I feel good, follow him. We don't know how to follow the Holy Ghost. Nehemiah 9.20 said, He gave his good spirit to instruct them. What can you learn out of that? Well, you're tall. How tall are you? Six five. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean that. God, that's fun. Six what? Six five. God, are you do basketball or anything? Oh, man. <sighs> I used to play black basketball and the guy broke my rib. Mm-hmm. We was in the church league, won the church league all the time. And I was pastoring. So I decided, hey, let's get in. We got in the city league. Woo! First game we got in the fist fight. <laughs> and there we got Baptist Church. Jesus is Lord. Them guys beat us like a drum, man. The city league, you know. You try to go up for a rebound, they just pull your drawers off nearly, you know. That's, what, that's where I got my book. I went up and the guy elbowed me. <laughs> I got stories, man. Good Lord. Let's talk about some stuff. Y'all want to? I got, I got, a, I got a message I'm going to preach in a moment. Pastor Joe asked me to, uh, 
to share an event that happened to me once, a very sacred event, something I, I don't think you'll ever hear anything like it. I was in my bed at 2.22 a.m. one morning, and Jesus Christ appears at the side of my bed and said, Get up! Let's go fishing. I said to him, This is not a time to fish. He said, Get up and let's go fishing. Now, he don't make suggestions. He gives direction. So I get up, and the next thing I know, I'm not in my bedroom any longer. I'm standing at the, the coastline of the ocean. And there's a storm going on like you can't imagine. Lightning, wind, waves, water, just... And it, the wind's blowing so hard, you've seen these guys trying to uh, give a report in a hurricane. And I had to stand like this. The wind's just blowing him down almost. And I look, there's Jesus standing. His robe's not flopping. His hair's not blowing. He does like that. And I stepped over there and he said, I'm still the Prince of Peace. Right in the middle of the storm. There I was about to be blown down and he was perfectly uh, at peace. So I step over there by him. Lightning flashing, wind howling, waves roaring. And the Lord said to me, uh, catch me a fish. And uh, I, I said, uh, Lord, this is not really the time to fish. <laughs> Lightning, storms. He said, no, Bobby, it's the best time to fish. Now we're talking about soul winning. We're talking about winning a harvest, God's way, not ours. I'm standing at the, the ocean, biggest storm you could imagine. The Lord said, catch me a fish. I felt so scared. I said, Lord, uh, this is not the time. He said, yes, this is the time. So I'm still trying to excuse myself from the mission. And I said to him, I, I don't have anything to fish with. And the saddest countenance came over the Lord. And he said to me, you don't understand, do you? And as he's saying that, he reached inside of his chest and pulled out his heart. And put a piece of his heart in my hand. The piece of the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ said in my hand, hand, said in my hand, oh, and he said, take this and cast it on the water. And I said, no, Lord, no. And I'm telling you, he said, yes. I cast it like that as far as I could throw it. It went up in there like this. Starts down in the wind, the waves, and a gigantic fish. Leaps out of the water, takes a piece of his heart in his mouth and falls back in and swims right to our feet. At that moment, I had divine knowledge. The Lord said, uh, how much does that fish weigh, Bobby? I said, it weighs 55 pounds. He said, that's right, but now it's 55 times 55. And it multiplied like that. And inside of that fish, you could see transparency. You could see thousands and multiplied thousands of fish just like it. And he said, pick it up. I picked it up. It was as wide as this room nearly. And it was effortless. And the Lord took the big fish and pushed it into his heart just like this. See, this is the time to fish. You've never seen such a storm in the world like there is right now. Chaos in every nation. And now's the time to give them a piece of his heart. You understand that? I'm telling you, wow. Well, I, 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 that was in the shepherd's rod time, and I wrote about it. I called Fishing in the Storm. Oh, see, we've got everything we need if we just know how to follow Him and do with what He's given us what He tells us to do. But I want to tell you something. When He put a piece of His heart in my hand, I understood from the deepest of depths what it meant when it says, we're not, corrupt, we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The word precious there, we don't even have a word for it. It's called incalculable. So valuable, you can't put a value on it. The blood of Jesus. Wow, so that's what Pastor Joe wanted me to share with you because a lot of times we think, this is, I'm, I, I'm too busy to go fishing. This is not a convenient time. There's never been a better time. People are looking for answers. Amen. They, they thought they'd find it in wealth. They didn't find it there. They thought they'd find it in prestige and they couldn't find it there. Real peace is found where? In Jesus Christ. And I, I implore you to become very active in soul winning. Tell them the good story. Tell them the gospel, okay? Uh, I hope you will. I hope you will. Whew. Boy, I was back on that ocean. Uh, I, I want us to uh, realize 
These stories are real. They're more real than they're more real than us sitting in this chair. I'm telling you guys, Jesus Christ put a piece of his heart in my hand. And he told me to cast it over this troubled sea. Wow. So you believe you have something precious from the Lord to give to hurting humanity? You've got the love of God. Bob Jones died and stood before heaven. And God asked him one question. Did you learn to love? See, love never fails. When God got ready to describe himself, he said, God is what? Love. love. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Wow. Christians can be very vindictive and hateful, can't we? Yes. That's opposite of what God said we're to be. We need to let the love of God prevail. Amen. You may be in this room or watching by some media and say, You don't know what they've done to me. That, that's true. But whatever they did to us can't be what we did to God. Amen. And God says in the book of Ephesians, Be kind tenderhearted one to another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. No matter what they've done to us, it does not give us license to retaliate. All right? All right. You doing well? God bless you. I mean that. Ah, boy. You know the difference between squalling and bawling and weeping? Mucus. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I got some stuff to talk about. Here's what I want to talk about. You want to, you want to hear it? I want to tell you the devil is after something God's given you, and it's called hope. The devil is relentless trying to steal your hope. He wants to steal your hope any way he can. But Hebrews 10.35, Hebrews 10.35, what does that say? It says, do not fling away your steadfast hope in God. Because your steadfast hope in God brings with it a great recompense of reward. Now, an uh, English translation that in a week can understand, it says, Hold on to hope, it pays big dividends. Now, I'll tell you what the devil wants to do. He wants to get us hopeless. He wants us to believe that all of the opportunities have passed. And hopelessness is not a... Hope deferred makes the heart what? But when you get what you've hoped for, it's a spring, a life spring. A, a bubbling fountain of life. And God wants to show you how to hang on to hope. You ready? Yes. You know why you need to hold on to hope? One day can change everything. Amen. One single day can change your whole destiny. Yes. You want to see it in the Bible? Say yes, Bobby. Yes. All right. Okay, here we go. Psalms chapter 30, verse 5. Before we get in the message, I want to, I want to talk to this uh, angel TV thing. A moment ago when you were talking about how they need to support angel television, well, here's what happened to me. I, I got into a trance, and I saw an Arab sheik, I, I, one of these all-rich Arab sheiks, and he's going to watch this program right here that I'm talking to. I'm talking to you, sir. You've got all the money you can compile together. You run a whole, a whole field of oil and wealth and all of that, but your 23-year-old son has a brain tumor, and all your money cannot solve that. There's no doctor you can get this boy to that can settle this brain tumor, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to you. You're going to watch this over angel television, and God is going to speak to you. You're not even a Christian. You don't even know Jesus Christ is Savior, but He's going to show Himself good because the goodness of God leads to repentance. And God Almighty is going to come and touch your son and He's going to erase this brain tumor and it's going to turn your heart to Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, you will. You will support Angel Television because you realize this. God used that TV program to save your son's life and to save your soul and you are going to begin to tell people, even those in your business realm, about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Alright? Alright. You say, well listen, it's dangerous to do that. It's better than losing your son. Alright? Now, so I release this on, uh, I release this and I thank you, Lord, that you will come and rescue this young man and you'll take out the brain tumor and it'll be a marvelous move of God. You said, Father, the goodness of God leads to repentance. So, Lord, bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo! 
Well, that's good. You go, oh, well, you know, you think an Arab will be watching. I know it more than you sitting here. He's just real sitting there watching this down the road as you sitting there. When God sends out a word, it will not return back to Him void. It will accomplish the purpose for which He sends it. We don't get up here and just spout off something. Remember the other night I said, I see an angel flying right along here. He's going to the children's. Guess what the children's department was doing? They were huddled up saying they're teaching about angels covering them. Is that correct? And what happened? This angel flew by. I said, where is he going? He's going to huddle around the children. See, we get up here and you go, well, Sadhu saw Jesus standing in front of him. Hey, Sadhu saw Jesus standing in front of him. Do you understand what a privileged people we are to see the Word of God come alive? Move active? You know, that, that's what makes this conference different. You know, well, we heard some good messages. If it doesn't move you to action, you should have stayed at the house. Be a doer of the Word. Do you understand how privileged we are to see the Word of God unfolding right before us? When I say Jesus appeared to me, I mean Jesus Christ appeared to me. Not just some kind of trance. He appeared to me. More real than Joe Sweet sitting there. Realer, uh, he's the realest real you can get. You can't get any realer than him. Isn't that something? That's right. That's right. He's going to pick up the pieces. You understand that? You've tried to put the puzzle together. God nearly lost your mind. But God can put the puzzle together, okay? All right? Yeah. Well, I sound argumentative, but uh, I'm part of the devil lying to people. You know, the Lord told me one time, he said, You go to the world and tell them they lied about Humpty Dumpty. What? Remember the little nursery rhyme? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. He said, you tell them I can do what the king's horses can't. There's nothing so shattered God can't put it together. He can restore back everything the canker worm has consumed. Well, listen, you say, well, but we'll talk about it. Okay? Good. Well, Wow. He said he's going to give you a sword. Amen. The Lord's going to give you a sword and you're going to fight off. Okay? That'll be a suck. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a spear one time. Y'all heard it about when the angel came and gave me the spear of Phineas? What? What, Bobby? Yeah, you, ought, you ought to hear it. it it's the wildest story. Uh, Bob Jones and I were doing a meeting and... Uh, at that time, Paul Keith was doing, uh, uh, he was a businessman actually, traveling uh, with us. And so he knew that Bob would get visitations at night. So well, we're down at a Morning Star uh, uh, doing a conference, and they had us all in one big uh, house. At that, that time, it's called Kevin's House. So anyway, uh, I'm up there asleep in the bed, and Bob is down having breakfast, and Paul Keith is there, and he always understood that Bob would have a visitation during the night. So, all of this is documentable. So, Paul Keith was a little jittery. Going, well, Bob, anything happened last night? And you know Bob. He's interested in those two eggs, uh, toast, and some, uh, <laughs> some grits. And he goes, yeah, yep, yeah, it did. It did. Something happened last night. He said, I was going up to heaven like this, and an angel was coming down like that. And I stopped the angel, and I said to him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to see Bobby Connor. And Bob said to the angel, well, why are you going to see Bobby Connor? He said, to give him this. All right, now I'm up in the room to sleep. So I wake up and I come down to have breakfast. There's Paul Keith, there's Bob. And uh, Paul Keith's still chittery. I'm trying to get my eggs. And uh, Paul Keith says to me, <coughs> Bobby, anything happened last night? I go, yeah, it did. About 3 a.m. I had to get up and go to the urinal. <laughs> now, this, this is true. You can giggle all you want to. About 3 a.m. I had to get up and go to the urinal. I'm sitting at the urinal in Kevin's house. Shoom! An angel came and said, here, take this. Now, I don't know about you, but inquiring minds want to know what is it. <laughs> don't you think? Bob saw him coming, stopped him, said, where are you going? I'm going to see Bobby Connor. Why are you going to see him? To give him this. I just testified. An angel came, said, here, take this. He gave me the spear of Phineas. Remember when Israel was under great plague? 
because they're living away from God, living filthy and living in sin and immorality. And an Israelite took a Midianite woman, brought her into the tent of the meetings. It says Phineas, out of the jealousy of God, jerked up a, ja a spear and penetrated both of them and broke the plague off the people of God. I carry the spear even today. It's called the holy jealousy of God. Well, look out now. See, God's tired of talking about a God you can't prove. He's showing up and showing off, don't you think? Mark asked me, he said, what are some of the, some, what are some of the most memorable things you can think about? And I said, oh, here's one. Bob Jones and I were in a big coliseum, and Bob's sitting there, and I'm supposed to be preaching, and I got to feeling athletic. So I ran, and I jumped on the bottom of the chair right here, right there, on the bottom of the chair. I was as stable as a gymnast. I thought, wow, this is something. I'm going to jump right here. I jumped right here on the back of a chair. I'm still as stable as standing right here. So I thought I'll jump on the next one. I jumped on the next one right here. I jumped on the next one. I jumped on 18 rows, landing on the back of this, standing up like Dorothy Hamill. <laughs> 18 rows. Can you do it? Give it a hop. <laughs> See, it was supernatural. See, God wants to show up and show off. Can you? That's it. I jumped 18 rows landing right here. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Bob Jones said that's one of the most supernatural things I've ever seen. <laughs> Pretty amazing. <laughs> you, what's the use of that? Well, pretty startling. <laughs> I fell in the middle of a bunch of rich looking black people. They go, you all right? I said, probably not. <laughs> that's what I said. Yeah. Well, we better talk about stuff. Here we go. How long we got? Well, my plane leaves tomorrow. Here we go. Y'all ready? Hold on to hope. Hebrews 10, 35. One day can change everything. Psalms. I'm screaming. Psalms. 30, verse 5. Come up here, tall man. Come here. Come on. I won't hurt you. What's your name? George. George, God bless you. Hey, George Foreman named all of his boys George. Didn't he have six of them? Uh, yeah, George Foreman named all of his sons George. I mean, uh, listen, that means that morning you just have to holler, George! You know, then all, all six of them get up. God bless you. You want a scholarship? Yeah, I'm trying to get one. Well, I'm going to pray for you. God will give you a scholarship, okay? Okay. Watch this now. It's all going to depend upon one thing. Whose kingdom will you build? God's kingdom. King, kingdom of God. Here's what's going to happen. God's going to move in this young man's heart about social justice to such a dimension. He's going to, he's going to get a scholarship. They think it's for hooping and all that kind of stuff. But it's going to be because his heart is, is crying out for justice. And that's where your education will come from and everything else. Okay? George! By George, it's going to happen. God bless you. Good. So you will. You'll get, your, you'll get your scholarship, okay? Play, but always give Him glory, okay? That'd be good. I mean, that, that's, God will pay for His education and everything else. Yeah, He'll end up, well, you'll end up with a doctor's degree from Pat Robinson's uh, uh, thing, all right? Yeah. One time I ran my hand through a little, little old kid's head, and, and I said, Hey, I know what you're going to... Yeah, at least you didn't cuss. I've had them cuss in church when I screamed. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know. but I ran my hand through a little boy's head one time. He's about eight. I said, hey, I know what you're going to be when you get big. And he goes, what's that? I said, you're going to be a famous surgeon. And his mom and dad were standing there, and I felt him say, who's paying for that? <laughs> but he's a famous surgeon right now. Right in the middle of med school, he called me and said, if you've misled me, I'm going to kill you. That's what he said. In the middle of med school. But here we go, Psalms 30, verse 5. Here, here it says, God's anger, God's anger is for a tiny moment. His favor is for a complete lifetime. And here's the part you remember, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen. Hold on to hope. One day can change everything. Joy comes when? In the morning. In the morning. There's the dawning of a new day. God's mercies, uh, lam lamentation says, are new every morning. So we're going to talk about how to hang on to hope. And that one day can change everything. I don't think there's any viv more vivid description of that than Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. You ever read that? You ought to read the Gospel of Mark. 
Every one of the Gospels presents Jesus in a different genre. Mark is the Gospel of action. The most repetitive word in the Gospel of Mark is immediately and straightway. Action. Say action. action. That's what God wants us to do. Action. But anyway, Mark, Mark is always showing the ministry and the action of Jesus. So Mark chapter 5. Uh, I call, you'll meet a guy there. I call him the nude, rude dude. Woo! The nude, rude dude. Have you, met, have you seen him? Uh, Sadhu talked about him a little bit. Uh, Jesus comes across the Sea of Gazaret, comes to a little town, steps off the boat immediately. It said immediately. That means right then there met him out of the tombs an un, a man with an unclean spirit. The word unclean spirit, there's a Greek word called demonitsamaya. It means under the total control of the devil. Now, where was he living? In a penthouse mansion? No! In the graveyard. Suicidal. Day and night, slashing himself with stones. And then you want to continue with witchcraft? This is the full flower of witchcraft. Yes. Suicidal, living in the graveyard with dead, rotten bones. Not any clothes comes running to Jesus. I'm glad Jesus didn't say, get back in the boat, boys. This is too tough. <laughs> I like what happened. Guy falls down there and screaming and screeching. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? Have you come to torment us before our time? Let me answer that. Yes! <laughs> yes! We're not going to build a church where demons are comfortable. We're going to build a church so full of the power and the presence, the blood of Jesus, when they walk in, they manifest. Start you a crew called SWAT. SWAT. Spiritual warriors administering truth. You know what I mean? You need your SWAT team. When one manifests and sit them tearing up the whole meeting forever, they drag them out, get them in a room, and get them delivered. They're back there in warfare and you're in here going worship. Hi, Shaham, Adida. Yeah. SWAT, spiritual warriors administering truth. All right. Okay. Well, is there any other ideas you have for us to be successful? Yes. See, I pastored for 26 and a half years. Woo. Don't you? Now, my counseling was a little different. You know, instead of going, bless your heart, sister, get over it, girl. <laughs> Deal with it and get over it. I'd counsel him every time it'd end up like this. Uh, 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 I, didn't, I, did, I, did, I didn't get picked homecoming queen. Good God, she's 54 years old. <laughs> Blown out because she didn't get homecoming queen. I said, good God, girl, get over it. Almighty God chose you to be the bride of his beloved son. And you're whining over homecoming queen? <laughs> then we want to go up and get in the throne of God? I don't care. See, Senor, huh? All right. Now, here, here, I pastored. And in churches, there can be cliques. You know what I mean? Everybody just associates with the same little group they like. And so I, I thought, I'm sick of these cliques. So I said, I'm going to come up with a program. And it's called, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? <laughs> I get every member of our church to put a card in. And on a Wednesday night, Somebody would draw that card. Nobody knew who was coming to dinner until they knocked on the door. Do you see how it broke up the cliques? Because it, well, we'll invite, well, I did, I did that. But no, invite somebody you don't know. So we came up with this thing called, guess who's coming to dinner? Isn't that cool? And you never knew who it was going to be until you opened the door. Oh. <laughs> Good Lord. It's true. Did I tell you? Okay. I know we could talk a lot. Of, well, let me give, I'll give you the message so you can figure it out later. This, uh, Mark chapter 5, we get a naked, nude, rude dude there, and he's sitting in front of Jesus. Jesus says, what's your name? And my name's Legion. And Jesus Christ uh, gives the demons permission to get out of the man, go up in the pigs. The 2,000 pigs ran violently down a steep slope, jumped in the ocean, drowned themselves. Now we've got, what, 2,000 dead pigs? It's nothing less than a mass case of swinicide. Hey! <laughs> Don't you think? And so the guys that owned the pig, that kept 
the pigs ran to the pig owners and said, you better come out here, something's coming down. And they come and they see the man who had been demon possessed, who was in the tombs, mountains, crying, slashing himself. Now he is, what? Seated, clothed in his right mind. What a difference one day can make. One single day, he wakes up a naked maniac. He goes to bed that night, a missionary. Remember he said, let me go with you, Jesus. Jesus said, no, that's not the plot. That's not the plan. You go back to your friends, your family, show them, teach them, tell them what great thing the Lord has done for you. Said he went back to Decapitus, a 10-city region. And you read your Bible, it says, all that heard him marveled. Ask any theologian, it means everybody that heard him were saved. So he went from a maniac to a missionary in one day. That's about as big a transformation as you'll see. Don't you think? Didn't he have to go to Bethel or Bobby Connor School of Supernatural? He sat at the feet of Jesus. Wow. Amen. Wonder what our excuse is, you know. Amen. Well, I don't know enough yet. Well, this guy's a maniac that morning. <laughs> now he's a proven missionary. Led ten cities to Jesus in one day. Amen. What? And then we're going, well, you know, I need another. We got that many notebooks filled out at the house. When are you going to start activating what you've been listening to? Yes. Become a doer, James 1, 22. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. You go, well, I could have, should have. No, Psalms 92 said, you'll be full, full of sap, firm, and stable, bearing fruit in old age. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Psalms 92, 10. Firm and stable. I, I like that one, full of sap. <laughs> I found a verse in the Bible. You can live as long as you want to. What kind of car you got now? Pontiac 5 and a Lexus. A what? Pontiac 5 and a, a Lexus. Pontiac. Okay, Lexus sounds pretty good. What kind of car your husband got now? Well, he's got several, actually. Got several. Has he got anything that's interesting? He's he given a 63 split back window Corvette. Oh, that would be good. That would be good. Good. Okay. Yeah. Boy, I used to have one, that, uh, a, a 57 Chevrolet, yeah, with the, had my motor board out to a, uh, and it had a full race cam in it, and had headers, and it could blow the windows out of businesses. Yeah. You could pull up and they go, boom, and the windows, come on. I could pull up beside the police and toot my horn and run off and leave them. <laughs> this is all true. They gave me, a, they gave me a, a thing to fill out for the highway patrol because I could outrun them. <laughs> Tried to hire me as a Texas highway patrolman. Ring. I had a 57 Chevrolet. It was, gas was 16 cents a gallon then. <coughs> Tell your husband I missed him, okay? Where's he at? He's flying out to Oregon to drive his brother home. Okay, that way he's, he's on a mission then. Yes, uh, okay. <laughs> I started to pop off about Oregon, but I, I used to preach there a lot. Oh, Lord. Wow, we've had some crazy times there. Ooh. Yeah. None of my meetings are just normal. <laughs> See, an angel showed up the other night. Remember I told you? Angels are here today. Yes. They're here to inspire you to keep on believing. They'll come to your house and encourage you. Amen. They'll scare the spit out of you. <laughs> and I saw an angel. I doubt it. You really see an angel, you'll start trembling. They're fierce. Yeah. One came to my house while I'm... Uh, listen. You, you come, if, you, if you want... Moravian Falls is a portal. Zinzendorf got the land where my house is built in the 1700s and deeded it to Jesus Christ, where my house is. Wow. Wow! They've had a 100-year prayer meeting 24 hours a day. It's a portal. Wow. Angels come. Angels go. Yeah. You go, well, I don't know. People have come by the tens of thousands. I live in a little cabin. Jesus knocked on the door. Remember the story? People have come by the tens of thousands. To, but see, that's not what you're after. You're after Jesus. Yes. You're getting His presence. Yes. One time I was, I was been climbing, there was mountains there, and I was climbing a mountain. There's a big old rock about the size of that thing there. And the Holy Spirit said, sit there. So I sat down on the rock, and here comes Jesus Christ. sits down right by me. He said, I've called you to this land to redeem this land for its original purposes. I said, what is that? He said, the salvation of the Native American, the protection of the Jews. Then he said, get under this rock. I said, I can't get under this rock. Bigger, you know, it's, it's half as big as this thing. He said to me again, get under this rock. So I looked and it had a cleft like this. So I'm, put, I'm 
I'm crawling, pushing up against a cleft to keep from falling down. And a big piece falls off, well, about the size of a china plate. And he said, what's that? And it's a perfect cut out of the state of North Carolina. Wow. Well, so Jesus shows up there. That's not bad. Isn't that something? Bob Jones told me, he said, I don't know how you can live there because of the divine visitation. That's why I do live there. Mm. Yeah. You believe there's portals on the earth? Have you read Revelations 4, 1? After this, heard a voice that said, come up here. And I looked, and there was a door, a gate, a portal standing open. God operates in portals, gates, and doors. Jesus is called the gate, isn't he? Open wide the gates. Yeah, that's good. You doing good? That's right. <laughs> I've been watching cage fight, and I can put a rear naked choke on anybody in here. You ever had one? It's sort of like going to heaven. They choke the air off of you and the blood off your brain, then you fall over and it comes back. And, yeah, I don't recommend it, you know, but uh, that's true. We used to do that before you got paid. That's true. Good gracious. I grew up really rough. Me and my brother sat in the backyard and shoot cigarettes out of one another's mouth with a twenty two rifle. Ah! My mama would come to the door and holler, hey, you boys quit wasting their shells. They cost money. <laughs> Didn't say a thing about shooting Bobby in the mouth or Glenn in the head. <laughs> we grew up rough, man. Wow, wow. Anyway, I better get into this message already. So the first, one of the first examples of one day can change everything is Mark chapter 5. The new Drew dude turns into a missionary. Woke up that morning, a maniac on, in a graveyard. Goes to bed that night, a missionary. You see it? Say yes. yes. Here, here's the next one. The largest famine mentioned in human history. Second Kings. Remember that? Say yes, yes. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24. There's a great famine in the land. The famine is so severe, it's the most drastic famine mentioned in human history. They're boiling their children and eating their children. 2 Kings 6, 24. That's the most desperate famine mentioned in human history. They're boiling their children and cannibalizing their own children because of this great famine. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1 says, Then, right in the middle of the famine, a prophet stands up and says, about this time tomorrow, there'll be more food in this village than you could imagine. They'll be basically giving it away. Now, you never get a good word like that without somebody trying to steal it from you. Yeah. A gainsayer, a guy that the king listened to, stood up and said, ha, that'll never happen. Don't put all your, don't, don't believe that. Even if God ran into the heavens and tore the heavens on them, that couldn't happen. Hmm. Wow. When you get a prophetic word, don't listen to gainsayers. That's right. Hang on to what God tells you. He'll move heaven and earth to fulfill what he says. So here's what, ha here's what happened. Right in the middle of the famine. It's, it's the saddest story. I, I, hate, I hate it when I read it. It says a, a woman is screaming at the king. King, king, help me. And the king's walking on the wall. And he says, ma'am, there's no, I have no means of helping you in any way. The oil is empty. The flour has gone. There's no way I can help you. And she's just screaming at the top of her voice. And here's what the king says. Why is it at, your, at your, this point of agitation? This is a part I can't believe. My mind won't even go there. And here's, what, why are you at this high point of uh, agitation? And the woman says, because of her! This woman! She told me yesterday, let's eat your son and tomorrow we'll eat mine. And then, here's the part I hate. So we boiled my son and ate him. My mind won't even go there. Yeah. Amen. So we boiled my son and ate him. Mm. And then today she's hidden her son. She wasn't weeping over the fact that she cannibalized her own son. She's mad because this woman won't provide dinner. Oh, God. That's the worst famine mentioned in human history. When you eat your, the fruit of your own womb. Oh, man. Wow. So we bought my son and ate him. I tell you, oh, God. And about that time, right in the middle of that, the Second Kings chapter... Uh, 7 verse 1 says, Then, right in the middle of that, a prophet stands up and says, About this time tomorrow, and you know the story, don't you? Four lepers go out and they find the village there where the warriors have been. It's evacuated. All the food is there. And everything God said would happen, happened. There were more food in that village. They were basically giving away. Is that true? Yes. So what happened? They woke up in the worst famine mentioned in human history and they went to bed that night in a feast. Hold on to hope. One day could change everything. Amen. And if you want to see the next one, it's in 2 Kings. It talks about the restoration of Mephibosheth. He woke up in a rag shack in Lodibar, and he goes to bed in the king's palace. He woke up 
uh, destitute and broke. And he, he goes to bed that night, one of the richest people on earth. He gets back all the money that was his grandfather's King Saul, all the treasures that was his father's Jonathan. Wow. It's the greatest wealth transfer mentioned in human history. Yes. Mephibosheth. Little old bitty crippled prince got crippled when he's five. Was raised in a, a tent. A city called Lodibar means dry, barren, uninhabitable. With his uncle Malkar. I dare uh, Malkar, I despise it. It means salesman, but it means the kind of salesman that sells his daughter down at the camel stop. A pimp. A thug, a, chice, a shyster. Don't you know every day he said to that little crippled prince, hey boy, if it wasn't for old Unc, that king back there, he'd slit your throat, drag you off. And one day, sure enough, King David kind of comes to himself and says, oh my God, I made a promise to Jonathan. I would show him favor and kindness and I haven't been negligent. And he called Ziba and said, Ziba, is there anybody left of the household of Saul that I could show him favor? And he goes, yeah, yeah. Jonathan had a son. Uh, Mephibosheth, but he's down in Lodibar. And King David said, go get him. Wow, so he woke up in a rag shack, goes to bed that night in the palace. One day can change everything. Amen. Weeping may last the night, but joy comes in the morning. Wow, isn't that something? All right, George. I, that's, I'm serious now. You go, what about me? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what about me? Start bragging about what happened to him and it'll happen to you. Instead of being vindictive and if you rejoice when something happens, that's a seedbed for it to happen for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look out now. I like this guy with the sunglasses up on his hat. Here's the deal. You want to hear it? You've already said, I'm not going to let people manipulate me, so God's going to give you a dream that will straighten some stuff out. Okay? Because you've already said, I'm not going to be manipulated. So God's going to give you a dream. In the book of Job, he said, I spoke to you and spoke to you. You didn't even think it was me. But in the night season, I'll speak to you. And he'll give you some strategies for the days that are ahead of you in a dream. Okay? Get you a notepad or something because the devil will try to steal it. Jot it down. Okay? Don't let him forget it. Now, that's good. Dreams. He goes, you got anything for me, buddy? The whole thing's been for you. <laughs> that's right. I, I get through preaching sometimes. I go, do you have a word for me? I just got through. There's a whole book full of them for you. God said, don't, you, don't let them use your gift to feed their laziness. The that's right, that's right. Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. That's right. I'll tell you what's going to happen. All right. Well, we're going to come against addiction. And we're going to break off addiction off of your family members. Amen. I don't care how long they've been addicted. I don't care if it's meth. I don't care if it's opioids. We're fixing, we're fixing to do Isaiah 61 verse 1. On, Isaiah 61 verse 1 said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to set the captives free. Jesus. I don't care how long they've been on it. I don't care how many kick programs they've gone through. God's going to deliver them. Yes. You want them delivered? Yes. If, you, if you want them delivered, stand on your feet. I'm going to agree with you. The Bible said if any two of us will agree, they'll get what they're asking God. Yes, All right. I don't care if it's grandsons. I don't care if it's sons or daughters, husbands or wives. God is going to release a spirit of deliverance right here. Lord Jesus, you said the anointing of God rest upon us to set captives free. There's men and women, boys and girls that are addicted to all kind of, for, for all kind of drugs, all kind of psychedelic mess. And right here in Lancaster today, we take authority over that in the name of the Lord Jesus. I break addiction. I break those those witchcraft spirits in the name of Jesus. And I say, Lord, set the captives free. Lord, I pray you'll break every shackle the devil's put them in. I pray right now that you would heal them and complete them and set them totally free. I pray, that, I pray they'll flush the mess. They'll get it out. They'll throw it away, burn it up. Lord, I thank you. This day, freedom starts. This day, captives are set free. In Jesus' name, amen. Good. Now believe that, okay? Oh, God. Woo! Here's what it says. It says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. The word indeed means irrevocable, unrescindable, okay? Free indeed. I don't care how long they've been bound. There's freedom. Freedom. Wow. I've been in that... I know exactly what they, they used to.
They used to tie me in the bed. I'd beg my brother to shoot me in the head, honest to God. I was addicted to all that mess, good Lord. I, I, they, they tied me together to, with, in a bed with uh, bed sheets. My brother and my sister would set up for days, bathing me with alcohol and ice cubes. It felt like every hair was on fire. It felt like my skin cells were just melting on me. And I'd beg my brother to just shoot me in the head. Oh, man. Wow. I know what it means in Psalms 40 where it says, I waited patiently upon the Lord. He inclined unto me. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He established my goings. He put a new song in my heart. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust the Lord. Boy, I'll never forget it in a jillion years. During that time, they, they, they nurtured me. I couldn't eat. I was just in a mess. And then one morning I woke up and I was hungry. But watch this. I will tell you, the devil is relentless. Uh, uh, this is a, a sad moment in my life. Uh, I'd been tied in the bed. They'd been nurturing me and trying to help me. And I wake up that morning and uh, I, I, was, I was okay. But instead of giving God glory, I said, look what I've done. Mm. See, most of my friends shot their head off or crashed their car into a, a bridge. And I kicked it. So my mother is, I'm going to go to town. I've been tied in a bed for over a month. And my mother is ironing my blue jeans. And she's crying. Big old crocodile tears running down my mother's face. Landing on the blue jean legs. Tss, and the iron would do like that. Tss. And I said to my mama, Mama, why are you crying? You know, mothers know thefts. I said, Mama, why are you crying? She said to me, Bobby, please don't go to town. I said, oh, mama. I slapped her on the arm like that. I said, oh, mama, I've kicked this. I've. I've. I put on those blue jeans. I put on a shirt. I drove my fast car to town. I hadn't been in town 10 minutes. I'm back behind the B&B &B cafe. I'm girded up, and I've got drugs running in me. The next time I see my mama, I'm in jail. And my mama walks at the jail. There she is standing outside the bars. And she said with the most uh, desperate thing, she said, can't you ever change? And I said, no, no, I can't. Wow. See, we've got to get really helpless before we get help. You believe that? See, if we still think you can do it in your own flesh, you're not there yet. Your flesh can't do a thing. Boy, it was during that time I got let out and I met Carolyn, my wife. She was totally different than me. Totally different. Boy, Heidi, you talk about pay, pay the price. We married and she would start at the church. I hated church. I'd catch the preacher. I'd shove him. I'd curse him. I'd beat him to death. In the, I'd have beat him to death. He'd look at me with the big old blue eyes and say, Bobby, I love you. But anyway, my wife started going to that church and got saved. She'd come, kneel down to pray for me. I'd kick her over. She'd get dressed for church. I'd beat her up, tear her clothes off of her. I watched her make her face back up, put on clothes, and start walking eight miles to church, me cursing her every breath. Wow. See, I tried everything the world had. And then they said, what you need is a wife, a kid, and a white frame house. I got a wife, a kid, and a white frame house, but I still had horrible, horrible demons. So I let them out at church one night, drove my car deep in the woods, going to shoot myself. And I'll tell you, back then, I was not afraid of nothing. I popped the shotgun out from under the seat, popped it like this, stuck the gun in the roof of my mouth. The whole car filled with demons. You may not believe in them, but I'll tell you, they're real. The whole car filled with demons, and they started chanting and screaming, Do it! Do it now! See, the devil comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. I had the gun up in the roof of my mouth. I'm one flick of my thumb away from hell. I started shaking like a leaf. I mean, shaking. I wasn't afraid of nothing. I started shaking, trembling, put the gun on safety, threw it in the back seat of the car. I drive back to the church. Nearly everybody's gone. I let my wife out about 5 o'clock. It's something like nearly 11 o'clock at night now. Boy, I'm sitting there broken. 
And I said these words. I said, Jesus, if you could, would you change my life? And just like that, whoo, the whole world went from pale gray to vivid color. I walked in that room. There was my wife and little boy praying. There was Paul now praying, the pastor. There's Ronnie and Sharon Costin and other young Christian couples praying. I'm back there at the door and I heard him crying out, Oh God, whatever it takes, save Bobby. See, if it hadn't been for that, I'd be in hell instead of Lancaster. Yes. See, there's some people you can't talk to about God, but you can talk to God about the person. Amen. You see what I'm talking about? Okay. So, wow. Thank God for people that'll help us. Aren't you glad? Yes. My wife told me after we married, we started in the supernatural ministry. She said, Bobby, I'll follow you anywhere God leads you. I'll do anything God asks you to do. You ever get weird and start faking this, I will be the first person to expose you. <laughs> now that's, that's, and she means every word of it. Isn't that good? We need accountability like that. Well, anyway, listen, I've, I've, well, we better get out of here. I'll sign some books.